Welcome to the Practice You podcast. My name is Elena Brower. Together, we'll explore and enjoy content and conversations around mastering transitions. In our relations, our wellness, our careers, our families, and especially in our missions and visions. You are invited to learn and love and listen with me. Welcome to Practice You. Welcome back to the podcast. I am mid-quarantine in great happiness to share a conversation with Pixie Light Horse, a longtime friend now and a dear ally on the path. Welcome, Pixie. Thanks for having me. Yeah. I am really concerned in many ways about the current state of affairs And when it comes to the work that you do in terms of your prayers of honoring your desire to, as you say in your, in your site and your work often to restore the bonds between people and nature, healing interior and spiritual or religious trauma, there has never been a more appropriate time for your work, I feel. And I would love to talk about that because I think there's a great need for every community to have a voice of honoring, of reclaiming our relation with nature and reclaiming our relation with ourselves. Where would you like to begin is the big question, because I have so many places I want to go with you. (laughs) Well, I think I'll just echo what you've said, that it is, um, it seems like some of the work that I've been creating and that many have been creating, um, that like now's the time to really apply that. Um, We've been enjoying, I've been enjoying writing prayers and um, we've been moving along on a particular trajectory that has felt Mm sustainable-ish. And and now I think that the game has really changed in so many ways that it's becoming more, it's becoming a little bit more urgent to hold our tools in our hands and really work with what we've got. That's well said. When you talk about the tools, here's a place where I feel you have an extreme command of a lot of different traditions and indeed actual and figurative tools. I would love to address the folks who are falling into the trap of consuming too much media thereby becoming swept up in theories and belief systems and stories may or may not be true, but it's the sweeping up that concerns me. The truth of these things I don't know, and only time will tell. But when people get swept up, thereby incapacitated by the amount of information that they're consuming, I would love to be able to provide a tool for that person. Yeah, I mean, I think that we can take an inventory of the tools that we have on hand. Some of us feel very close to things like meditation, prayer, um, walking outside in nature, and, and some of these tools are like the ones that we already have. We've already established a relationship with them. Managing chaos it is difficult for people, particularly in colonized nations, to be able to deal with. We've really had to unadapt and unclaim some of the numbing techniques that we've learned throughout the previous, you know, six, eight, ten generations and our survival physiology that has really been passed down intergenerationally. Uh, we're learning just, it seems like now ish to like deprogram from that. And so managing the chaos of news and the onslaught of fear tactics and scaremongering and things like that has never been super simple for us. And, you know, obviously our discomfort with issues around race and 
climate crisis and some of these other really critical kind of peak issues that, you know, our gasoline consumption and our resource use, like we have buffered ourselves out of a need because of our survival physiology that we find ourselves in so often, we're still buffering ourselves um, to that. And so this is an interesting time where we're not going and doing as much, but we can still keep living that trauma on a loop by engaging in fear and threat. And I think what is really counterproductive about that is that we haven't really assessed what the opportunity is for us to do some deeper levels of healing, to do some deeper inventories of what it is we actually have to work with, what's getting in our way, what are our inner obstacles and challenges, what are our beliefs that no longer hold. You know, you can go as deep as you have tolerance for, but time is sort of calling us right now to increase our bandwidth of tolerance, to widen our window as psychological professionals and healing professionals say so that we can be with the discomfort of it without repeating that really like chemical threat in our bodies that cause us to want to numb or dissociate and kind of fall back into vice habits and things like that yeah that's well said too i am finding many folks in my community and surrounding communities who feel uncomfortable with what's happening, who have found by whatever means, via YouTube or other websites, interviews with people who are purporting that all of this is some sort of grand scheme. And, <laughs> you know, even if it were true that this entire thing is some sort of plot, okay, I'm saying this with a smile on my face because I don't know if it's true or not, but even if it were, I want to know, Pixie, what is the point of people digging up all of these conspiracy theories, sharing them as though they have done rigorous scientific research, and sharing them in social media in order to gain the attention and the fear of others? What purpose does that serve? And how, more importantly, do we as people in the parallel universe of these folks see what they're doing, have pity for them, and move on without being swayed or touched by their practices? Well, I think probably a good many of us have looked into various theories on bioterrorism and some of the motivations that people in power may have for continuing to threat or oppress or take away freedoms and things like that. And I think that when we're perhaps the victim of such scaremongering, it's possible, and I don't want to pathologize, I'm obviously not a psychologist, but it's possible that there are certain parts of us that are yet untended, unmothered, unhealed. And so it's sort of like... Um, it's kind of like when someone baits us in order to like engage in some gaslighting behavior or something that will really activate us and highly arouse us to create kind of a pandemonium or a, a big chaotic response that some part of our inner selves is likely to be really responsive to. And creating chaos is one way of like managing chaos. That's what I'm seeing. Yeah, we, we kind of scapegoat or project that out. And it can be, you know, really counterproductive to one's health and yet very productive for keeping internal systems going in the way that they have learned how to behave, you know, learned through traumatic experience. So maintaining the trauma state mm -hmm. by sharing, I see. That gives me a little more compassion and understanding, actually. Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think it's easy to go to those places inside of ourselves where we feel intolerant that some people are uh, reacting in a certain way. And so I think that we also have to widen our own bands of tolerance. Like, I can tolerate that these 
folks are so uncomfortable with this that they're really seeking to stir up themselves and stir up others. It's, it is so much to me about managing chaos, internal chaos and external chaos. Yeah, that helps a lot, actually. For my listener who is seeking ways, tools, means to manage their own discomfort around lack of control, and this is whether you can put food in your in your mouth and a roof over your head or you cannot. What are the tools that you're teaching to your people at this time to help? I am, for the most part, I'm still doing some of the things that I've always done. I send out a, a newsletter with a worksheet in it on Fridays and an audio prayer. I'm starting to show up in my social media um, spaces actually reading the prayers and trying to give people just a few minutes of stillness in their bodies to actually be in and stay in our bodies. Because I think that an experience like what we're all collectively having happen externally is um, helping us to kind of dissociate and want to numb out and not want to be in our bodies because we're carrying so much fear. And so anything that I can possibly offer to help people be in their bodies and be like connect to that core of peace has been, um, it's been what I've inclined to offer up. And it's also been kind of all I've got, (laughs) you know, like Mm -hmm. the tools I'm holding in my hands right now that are working best for me as I manage my own chaos Mm -hmm. and my family's chaos is to find all the many ways in which we can come back to a core of peace back to stillness and that involves acceptance which is we cannot change many many things that are happening Um, probably a lot of us would if we could we're starting to gently examine what we might not want to change about it or what there is to glean and learn from this um, and how we need to dial ourselves back in terms of our output to really honor the creature species that we are i love the idea of creating space with the family to really address this consciously. And Mm -hmm. I know you'll have some insight around this because of your, your kids are how old now? 11 and 14. (laughs) Wow. We're in the same boat. Jonah's 13. Um, Teach me about, and my listener about some of the things that you're doing during this time that are helpful and even healing. I mean, lots and lots of folks are having a very different experience from one another. And I'm trying to really not lump us all into the same boat because depending on your amount of luxury, privilege, whether you have a savings or not, how scared of money you are, whether you're working in the service industries as a medical worker or a first responder, you know, everyone's sort of in a different boat. So it's hard to find a blanket remedy that you can just kind of like throw over the whole thing, kind of like an antibiotic that allows us to address all possible offenders to the system. One thing that my family and I are doing, so I happen to be in the position of being able to homeschool um, or distance school, and having a an eighth grader and a fifth grader means that, you know, they're they're on different learning trajectories. They also go to different schools. And they're receiving different prompts from school, which is, you know, schools are having a really hard time getting a handle on on how much to give and how to interact and how to take this whole thing online. Um, For us, I'm really just trying to ease up on all of us, um, ease up on the pressure. I co-parent with an ex-partner. And so getting on the same page a little bit about what that looks like. You know, he's very structured and insistent that certain types of education need to ongoingly take place. And I'm much more lax. Mm. I'm like, you know, just do the bare necessities and then let's get outside and be in our bodies or get in a big old pile and read together or watch a film that is in some way generative of our energy rather than depleting of it. So, you know, watching biggest little farm or something that is, you know, holds some kind of hope for the younger ones is really important. For me, having a ritual every day that I can count on that grounds me and gets me in my hands and my body 
I'm like making muffins every day, you know, and I'm, I feel I'm sort of starting to scrabble around for ingredients and things yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, but it's a good exercise in learning to work with what we have on hand mm -hmm. and be okay with that and be with the discomfort of um, not having the things that we're used to having. I mean, people all around the world do not live at the level of access that we Westerners do. And even within our own nation here in the US, we have a lot of a lot of disparity, a lot of differences, learning wise, brain wise, economically, and etc. So I mean, I guess if I was going to address a listener who was not well resourced, I would maybe suggest, you know, what helps you feel still and calm and connected and at peace with the part of ourselves that are, you know, pre-embryonic, really traveling all the way back to even before our beginnings, in some ways having to not bypass, but like save some of the harder trauma work and for maybe a time when we feel more safe and just cultivate that deep, deep connection like a seed would with its soil and get still, get quiet, turn everything off. I mean, there are less planes flying overhead here. Sure. The phone's ringing less, you know, like there is less stimulus in many ways. And so how can we really work with that to create a calm space? Yeah. And if you have toddlers running around or, you know, if you're doing elder care and you've got to go in and out of medical facilities, it's just um, equally important and harder to come by at times to find that still quiet space. I mean, I'm imagining that for people who are stuck in a home with people that they usually get to take some space from, that that's going to feel pressurized, you know. So can we do some of these things together? You know, can we find a form of prayer or meditation that kind of really suits and serves everyone? Can we go to bed with the sunset one night a week or something and mm -hmm. just really restore our energies? They're yeah. get, it's getting pulled out of us because of our fear. And fascinatingly, even though this is supposedly the time of quarantine and everything is slowing down, I'm hearing from lots of people that actually their workload is ramping up. And that might be because, you know, sales for certain services and products and goods and things like that have really plummeted. Right. Um, you know, it's, it's very, very uncertain economic times. And unfortunately, you know, for the amount of luxury that we have been afforded in terms of the economy seeming to move along, at least in somewhat of a predictable pace, you know, that, that rug has been pulled. Pulled. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, really reimagining what we can do with what we do have and where we can ask for help, where are their resources? You know, it's humbling, I think, for people who are very unresourced to ask for help because if you've been scraping by and, and kind of living hand to mouth for a long time or for a while, then you've been getting by and you haven't had to ask for help. And that's a real matter of national pride for us. And so, there are many, many resources starting to pop up in, in my region, which I, I live in kind of a, not exactly an example of what the cross section of, of America looks like, but I am noticing that a lot of places are popping up to offer relief, whether it's to translate the news about the virus into a language that hasn't ever existed in our region, or to put very carefully and in a sanitary way, you know, put together baskets of food for folks who need deliveries. That stuff is really starting to pop up and, and probably started a few weeks ago. So that's heartening, but there's just like, if you have something, it's a really good time to share it. Yeah. The dissociation is something that stuck in my mind that I wanted to go back to. For many of us, we were learning that as kids because of whatever trauma we had to dissociate. And as a result now that things are so uncomfortable and it doesn't matter, like you said, how well or unresourced you are, it's still really uncomfortable relative to whatever you're used to. The real concern that I have is the dissociation that's coming along now is creating danger for other people. And I'm watching mm -hmm. it happen because people in positions of leadership 
dissociating, sharing mm-hmm. their versions of dissociation, are then causing chaos for the people who are following them. And because we're all so connected digitally, it's really an issue. It's not always apparent whether people in leadership that we're accustomed to following and feeling safe following, it's not always apparent whether they're in a dysregulated state or a highly aroused state when they're posting. Like our defensive accommodations have allowed us to come across as level when really we're quite activated and highly aroused inside. So, Mm -hmm. you know, information is coming across and we're feeling like it's safe, it's sound, And yet it may be coming from a really dysregulated place. So how do we assess whether that information is sound or not? I mean, we're, you know, to commit to being here and being in the body that we have right now sometimes requires us to really get acquainted with our intuition and to do a little internal checking like is that sitting right with me what part of me you know part psychology would say what part of me is gets stirred up by that or what part of me wants to shut that down or what part of me agrees with that or what part of me is making is this making me want to fall down a youtube rabbit hole Mm -hmm. um you know i'm getting a part of me is getting activated it could be the part of us that learned how to cope and accept It could be the part of us that was really traumatized and had to go completely underground and not be able to express. That helps a lot. The part psychology. James and I Mm -hmm. talked about that, I think, in our very first episode, our second episode here on the podcast. I think also the shamanic training that you've had, I don't know a whole lot about it, but I want to understand it now because I do think that it has some relevance. It brings us back to nature. I know that. It's great deep reverence for the earth. I know that. I would love to have you explain to me, maybe one or two listeners will benefit, but explain to me, what does shamanic training mean? And why is it relevant right now, as I'm sensing? I mean, the training may be less relevant than the the lens of it to be able to, and as Westerners, most of us, even as descendants of recently indigenous people are attempting to look through a lens that allows us to see ourselves in the world we live in that's not through, um, you know, clouded with colonial imprint and survival physiology of the last several hundred years. And so the relevance of any practice that allows us to see and experience ourselves in the world in a way that is, let me be real, really careful, caring about how I say this, um, a lens that, that takes us back to that core of peace. You know, there's been a lot of crossover in the last 40, 50 years of understanding that earth has a spirit and has a a body and is generative like every other living species on on earth and so the practice of shamanism has become intertwined with our psychological processes our somatic our felt processes Um, we're starting to do things pretty organically to apply meaning to our relationships with plants and animals and and things like that and the the real benefit i think at this point in time is to realize that humans as a species have been riding a very big wave of technology that has disconnected us from ourselves our bodies our presence on earth as a beneficial organism and the practice or the practiced individual can start to reconnect to that more primitive aspect of who we are on the planet and what our responsibility is and to look at this big wave of technology that we've been riding and see its harms and its benefits and dial ourselves in one direction or other you know very internal very very connected and also learning how to kind of zoom out and and become connected with the world we live in today and so the actual practice of shamanic journey for a self healer is to utilize elements of the imagination which is you know westerners are going to think 
about their dreams, about the very subconscious content of the dreams, to activate our imaginations, to delve into our interior landscapes and remember, remember, because we've become dismembered, mm -hmm. um, to remember and be able to retrieve our kind of lost, fragmented soul parts. This is generations, centuries, maybe even millennia in the making that we have kind of found ourselves in this state of, of starting to lose some of our sensory capacity. And so whether it's somatic experiencing or, you know, working with it, with the shamanic arts in the way that we know how to do it in the Western world, whether it is working with a psychological clinician or a healer or working with plant and herbology and oils as you do, all of these lenses serve as ways for us to see ourselves without all the trappings and mm -hmm. remind us that we're, we're animals here. We're animals sub susceptible to mutating viruses. We're animals susceptible to grief and loss and expression. And one of the most important things I think that we can talk about now is that inner journey, that inner travel is what takes us into that core of peace. And that's what we're kind of going for here. You know, we're looking to just even temporarily suspend the adrenaline and the cortisol and the hundreds of different chemicals that are kind of coursing through us and creating anxiety and depression and reactions and frozen states and and things like that. So we're looking, how can I connect so that I can be here fully? Mm. That helps. <laughs> that helps me so much. I've really, I've always kind of followed Alberto Valoldo. I've even taken classes with him. I read his books. I understand, but I never heard it explained in that, in quite that way. And to just have it be a way for us to reconnect to the heart of the earth, to the heart of ourselves, to the heart of what's what really matters mm -hmm. is very helpful. Yeah. There's some controversy sometimes about shamanism and sometimes that word gets kind of tossed out there and it yeah. sounds pretty exotic and it sounds mm -hmm. kind of like a real something that folks should reach for and strive for. Um, it's one of many roads that hopefully, you know, will take people to the same place of really honoring what is sacred in themselves in every single other living creature on the planet. And that's the reason why it drew me in 20 years ago when the climate was really different for cultural appropriation and what was okay to share and, yeah. and things like that. And so I think it's important to keep our bearings in terms of where where we are and and what our own ancestors can share with us and things like that as well. Yeah. I um, fell in love a while back with the Build Your Council worksheet. I use it all the time. <laughs> and I thought it might be nice for my listener. First of all, you can you can subscribe to Pixie's weekly emails and worksheets which are stunning and helpful. But she says in the Build Your Council worksheet, our inner council is working on our behalf to strengthen us for comprehension. Each of us has a mental panel made up of supporters, fear mongers, wounds, memories, a witch brewing healing, a warrior ready to raise the sword. We are under many influences, causing us to feel uplifted or beaten down. Think about your inner team all the archetypes you're made up of. Think about the internal repairs you must make to keep going. And then the prompts are so exceptional because I think, and especially for right now, because I think too many of us are looking outwardly for answers, mm. for counsel. And I think the inward counsel, at least for, in my case, for me has been far more um, helpful and beneficial to me. So the, the questions are like this for my listener. Do I have any reservations about acknowledging my inner voices? In parentheses, Pixie reminds us that it's okay that we quote unquote hear our inner promptings. Secondly, what names do I call the member of my inner council? 
Third, how can I understand what influences my life by listening to them? Four, do I have fears around how I am guided? Five, when I'm at my strongest, who am I listening to? Six, what member of my panel always guides me to the right move? Mm. Seven, what am I still carrying that can be lightened by my counsel? I mean, guys, before I go on, think about this for one second. Within you, there is an entire litany of voices, personas, personalities who are influencing you at any given moment. Who is telling you to go look at that ridiculous, unsubstantiated video about some scary thing that has absolutely nothing to do with your life? And what are you going to do about it even if you watch it? Who is the one who tells you to go get your ass in bed? Who is the one who tells you to go do your practice? I'll go on. Who helps me to get where I'm going most efficiently? Which of my inner voices am I most likely to trust? Mm. How did these sub-personalities come to be? It's so good. I feel like there are, I was reading from Mark Nepo this morning in the Book of Awakening, and I feel like there are, memories are not just memories, they're actual visits. Mm -hmm. Which member of my council would I like to connect with more? Which members encourage and uplift me? What do I look for outside of myself that I can look for inwardly? This is a guiding principle for me now, Pixie. Thank you very much. <laughs> for what do I need to ask for outside help? And lastly, how does diving deeper into my reserves help me show up in service to others? And you end it by saying, if you want a good, cool drink of water, you got to <laughs> dig a little deeper in the well, sister. <laughs> <laughs> my 80s are showing <laughs> oh baby we're the same age so i like it um thank you for that thank you for all the worksheets because the questions are always so timely and so helpful because we don't you know the sad part is we're not taught this in kindergarten this should be taught in kindergarten yeah i mean <laughs> can you imagine if you were taught in kindergarten like how cool I am working on some younger, younger reader um, pieces. It seems like the youngers are definitely, you know, in, emotionally intelligent enough. Yes. So many of them that they can, that they can process some of this at a certain level. I did just want to point out, like, um, that the member inside of us, or the you know the panel member who says go look into that conspiracy theory, which, you know, I still go like straight to Snopes and I want to debunk them before I actually bite down on them. Sure. You know, but that's the part of us that feels unprotected. It's a very innocent and childlike mm. part that mm. feels mm. like they need to brace for more damage. You know, it's an unhealed part. And that digging deep is, is something that you and I have been and so many of us have been working on for decades, but there are a lot of folks who still fear what happens when the floodgates open. Who is it right. going to harm in my immediate circle? Right. Like what kind of fresh hell and grief and pain will be unleashed? What will that look like? I'm afraid of those parts of myself. Got it. And so I think it's always worth like cultivating and really generating some compassion for where folks are while also saying, hey, if that isn't helping you, if that's harming you, if that's keeping you up at night, if that's diminishing the quality of your immune system, now is probably like not a great time for that. Or, you know, to give extra permissions and trauma sensitive language, like maybe you want to do that on a day when you feel really strong. And, you know, maybe you really want to strengthen the muscle to tolerate your fear and have a plan in place for what happens when you become dysregulated and just to really like massage that space with the people who are scared and hurting and reaching in all directions to try to find some answers. And as you said earlier, like gain some kind of control. It's really disempowering where, where things are at and control is really something I think we're being called to release. Yeah, it's a powerful, yeah. it's a powerful drug. 
helps to think about the folks who are doing that and spreading those things as working from an unhealed part, a scared part, resting for control, W-R-E-S-T. Yeah, maybe. I mean, also, we just, there's a lot of relief for me in just not knowing. Like, I'm not sure where this person is coming from. Um, right. You know, like, I don't know. Are they, if they were in a dysregulated state, I mean, the truly dysregulated aren't usually able to admit that. You know, so it's not something you can really inquire about to find out whether the information is sound right. um, and safe. But, you know, do I feel safe right now? Do I feel safe? Is my nervous system feeling like it has tolerance? Um, can I bear it? I think that there's a tremendous opportunity to do internal work right now, regardless of how this is all going to turn out or what the new normal is actually going to look like. Like we're, we're hermiting up in a way. And that, for me, is a very comfortable landscape to go tromping around in. But I don't really think that's so for a lot of folks. So the, you know, one of the invitations here in this conversation, Elena, might be, you know, when was the last time you nestled down and were with, you know, yourself? And we're so productivity oriented that we're like, we sit down for five minutes and we're like, oh, I've got to do this or I've got to tend to that or I need to send that email. And we're really um, prone to answering the various distractions and demands. And there's actually nothing, I don't believe, that's super pressing no. on an ongoing basis that we have to keep jumping up for. Like, can we just sit and be still? Can we learn to trust ourselves and feel safe inside of our own bodies and then take action from that place? Yeah, I think that's the, that's the main question right now. It has to be. And at the end of each of my recordings, I typically ask three questions and I would love to ask them of you. But the first one is what in your close space needs some healing right now? It's so funny because I'm like deep in some teen trauma healing right now personally. And it's in some ways this time and space makes for a great hotbed of doing that. And it's also can be very overwhelming. So I think, you know, I'm, I'm having to take my own advice here and, and parcel out like my energy so that I'm, I like to give, I like to overgive. <laughs> and so what needs healing maybe is my tendency to want to be there for anyone who calls on me and to, you know, put my phone on airplane mode and just set it aside and not feel like it's, it is an attack on my worth or my value or my purpose to not be a first responder during the times that I need to be just responsive to myself and or my children. That is beyond helpful. I'm sure to several people listening to this beyond helpful. Thank you. Mm. The second question, what's your favorite view? What's my favorite view? Like viewpoint? You get to take it where you wish. Some people <laughs> go to from my chair in my room in Italy on the water. Some people go to from inside of my head during meditation. I went to the side of my son's neck where his jawline is, I can't even. That's my favorite place. <laughs> yeah. I mean, my my children are both, you know, like Jonah. They're like my heart and my world, and they were wanted, and like they're yes. very privileged and all of these things. And yet they also can really drive me crazy. At 14, they're coming with like ASMR noises behind my head, and I'm like, I'm really easily activated right now. That buddy, that's not going to work. Um, just to keep it super real. But I think um, my favorite view right now is probably like being able to see more stars than I've been able to see in a long time. Mm -hmm. Fewer planes, mm -hmm. less light, less ambient light. Yeah, less pollution. It seems it's getting clear. And that means something to me. Yep. Yep. And the last question was really inspired by you in so many ways. I'll preface it by saying thank you to Mijanu, Mystic Mama, mm. 
one of my dearest friends from when the kids were born a zillion years ago, uh, who introduced me to you, <laughs> said, you have to read this right this second. I think she even sent me your book, oh. the first one, Prayers of Honoring. What does prayer mean to you is a question that I ask every single one of my interviewees based on what I've learned and come to understand through your work. So what does prayer mean to you today? Ah, uh, I mean, it's such a living, breathing body. It's so not a fixed state or practice or ritual. It's um, sometimes it's very like childlike, like my hands clasped together, you know, in front of me and like a genuine appeal for something, grace or calm or the ability to, to cope and deal. Sometimes prayer means, you know, my portal to connect with all those inner council members in the above and below and beyond and to really be able to listen. Prayer hasn't ever been for me just about making requests and then waiting for them to be delivered upon. It's a, it's a sacred space to commune and to learn and to hear the prompts, um, to hear the easy answers sometimes, you know, which sometimes seems so simple and we really want more and, and yet the, you know, the answers of how to be or what to do or what to do with your feelings is, is pretty simple, you know, sit, mm. slow down, rest, mm. child. Um, rest, child, lay down <laughs> your sword. Yeah, yeah, stop fighting, you know, or this is something worth fighting for, or I've got you, or it will all be okay in the end. And if it's not okay, then it's not the end. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Oh my gosh, that's so true. If it's not okay, it's not the end. Mm -hmm. yeah. what's, your, what's your view on death, lastly? Oh, I'm so glad you asked because I think that is a huge part of what's causing so much discomfort right I now. I agree. Yes. Yeah really really hard we are not at peace with our oncoming deaths we are not at peace with how we fantasize our deaths might look and go down with the powerless around it or the medicalization of it um, you know I've had the privilege of sitting at the bedside of people who are dying and really facilitating what I like to call a good death and that's by no means an original term of mine but a good death what does that look like and you know what would that look like for me and it's very different from i think how we've accepted death will look like and you know everyone wants to die in their sleep and have all their ducks in a row and not have anybody suffer you know we're we're just still mm -hmm. really hell-bent on not suffering not feeling pain and you know i look to the animal realm to the to the wild kingdom to go to say you know you all how is our species, which is so technological, how could we be doing this better? And, you know, the, the animals have a whole different way of dying. They feel everything and they, they die when they're dying, you know? Tell me, tell me more about this. What do, you, what do you understand and how are you taking inspiration from the animals? Because I really want to understand what you're talking about. Well, I mean, I think that I receive a lot of comfort in understanding how different species deal with first grief, how they grieve the loss of their young and or their, their friends. And obviously our animal companions, our domestic dogs and cats and things like that are gonna, we're gonna be able to see that in them if you're not out in the wild and really witnessing it. But to see an animal grieve the loss of something is to remember that it's sentient, it is, it feels things, it's caring. Animals also have really, un all different species have such uncanny abilities to downregulate their nervous systems. You know, they, um, if you've ever almost hit a deer with your car, the deer is absolutely frantic. It's where we get deer in the headlights from. They freeze or they jump, they fight, flight, you know, all of the things. And then they go down off the side of the road if they're if they're lucky enough to kind of make it off, and then they downregulate their system immediately. You know, they're two days later they might be wary of the highway, but they're not still living 
the trauma of almost being hit by a car. So animals have a way of transmuting stress in a way that we used to and can really remember and learn from today. And so, you know, animals dying a death from natural causes, let's say, or a death among their pack or their herd or something like that, they experience it all the time and they experience it in a very similar way. Our deaths have a lot of variability and we we have a system that really wants to stop it and um, prevent it. And, you know, we have a lot of technology to help us do that. So in many ways, we are still animal. And in many ways, we are, you know, species with options and medications and things that we can prolong it. So it's almost as though we know too much. And um, it's funny when I think about the animals that I have ushered into their death. I remember seeing a real you know, there wasn't much of a struggle. There was a great amount of peace and release. And when I've seen animals lose like a, a friend, you know, like if there were two dogs in the house and one dies, there's a lot of grief, yeah, like real grief. And I think that we're so afraid of grieving. We're so afraid of feeling that this is the result, this overly technologically advanced overly controlling, overly fearful reality that we've created for ourselves. Yeah. It's a big conversation. There's a book that I really love by Lucinda Herring called Reimagining Death. And it's just a nice conversation starter if folks mm -hmm. want to foray into that. I mean, feeling safe in our bodies, feeling safe in our in our life is is a good <laughs> good place to begin and as we begin to feel more safe and more accepting of life's cycles and the seasons um and as we experience the you know the deaths of loved ones around us and we feel how that really really feels if we can do that i think it's it opens up conversation like it's on the collective table, you know, like, how are we going to do this differently? This is needed. A lot of folks are talking about it and, and yeah. really starting to crack it down. And that's, that's really heartening. Yeah, it is very heartening. I have even a friend who's um, Sierra Campbell. She's creating a whole conversation around end of life, taking care of the elders. I'm completely inspired by all of this. And I think it's, that's an important direction for us to take. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, care for those who are, you know, dying, even just using the words death and dying and died and dead. It's been hard for us. We have a lot of language around kind of bypassing what that really is. Yes. It's so true. Let's, um, I want to pick this up with the death conversation because I feel like that's a really important one. And it's always, it's always close. It's never far from me. Mm -hmm. It's never far from me. After you, have you lost a parent yet? I've not. That's like the most holy time I've ever spent. Last thing, mm -hmm. putting my putting my cheek on my mother's belly when she took her last breath. Yeah. I I don't. I'm not even sad. Like I am smiling. Mm -hmm. It was so special. It was so holy. It was so important. And the thing that gets me right this moment is the number of humans who have to die by themselves without a touch. Yeah, that is really really. A concern that's without a, a touch, one. without a loved one being able to go in. I mean, yeah. that's not our fantasy of how we would like it to be for ourselves no. or for no. others. Uh, no. We want to be able to do this in a midwifed way, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk to Jonah's dad soon, who's a doctor on the front lines, and he's had to stand gowned at a distance with a phone in mm. his hand. Mm -hmm between the family and the one who's crossing over, the one who's dying. Yeah. There I was. I just used another language for it. That's funny. The one who's dying. And he's had to mitigate that communication yeah. dozens of times in the last several weeks. Yeah. Hard. I'm going to be talking to him soon. I have to. I finally decided I, I hope that you're ready. I said, Anthony, because you're getting interviewed for my podcast. I want to talk about this. <laughs> yeah. He finally relented. He was like, fine, fine, fine. We'll do it. 
it's not every one of us that knows, you know, of a doctor no. or a medical worker who's, you know, who we can have a really a candid conversation with about how it really is in there. That's right. Well, sister, I thank you so much. I could go on with you for days and we'll continue this for sure. But I want to thank you for your time today and thank you for your heart and all of the work that you do, everything that you are. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for bringing mm. this podcast to to others and for holding a space around folks while they navigate. Yeah, you bet. I wonder, maybe we should just do a, like a two minute prayer. Okay. Do you feel like reading or? I can, I can lead that intuitively. Mm -hmm. Cool. Let's do it. <sighs> With a big exhale. Maybe drop down, close your eyes, whatever feels holy for you. And connect with the source that nourishes you and feeds you and brought you here and will take you out when it's time. Knowing that life is impermanent and delicate and beautiful and fragile. And I ask the great mysteries to hold us and help us and guide us and be present for us. Help us clear the way for access to our higher selves, our sound selves, our mature reactionary um, or mature, maturely reacting selves to soften the impact of chaos. To be able to both be with what is and ask what we can be thinking, doing, feeling, and being. To give us those spaces, to help us give ourselves those spaces in, with the time that we have to connect to that core of peace within each of us and to engage this practice of stillness in some way that connects us to others, to imagine ourselves hugging and embracing one another in the ways that we enjoy, to get the extra rest that we need, to understand the ways in which community looks different now, and to participate as much as we have tolerance for, I ask of us and the sources that nourish us in all the many different variations and faith systems to commit to being in our bodies, to receive the invitation to be here for one another in the capacities that we can be for ourselves, for the children, who are hearing and picking up on so much and to expand in the direction that feels productive and generative, not in a gear turning way that is one of our numbing or coping mechanisms, but in a way that is expanding and nourishing I ask us to just all grasp virtual hands out of judgment of one another, out of criticism of ourselves, and try to just really cultivate that willingness to be with the discomfort of what is. And to bind that medicine with a few deep breaths, loosely and gently, with caring and compassion, and at the end of it all, love. That is exactly what we need, isn't it? 
Thank you so much. My pleasure. <laughs> yeah, really, thank you. More soonest and um, really, really thankful that you exist, Pixie Light Horse. Pretty thankful that you're existing too here, dear one. <laughs> <laughs> so much love. Talk soon. Thank you.